The recurrent migration to Washington, D.C. of African Americans in search of freedom, jobs, and justice, and their building of black communities have shaped the city's history from the beginning. Nanny Helen Burroughs came to Washington from rural Virginia in 1883, a time of increasing segregation and Jim Crowism. Acutely aware of the inferior education offered at that time to blacks, especially black girls, she struggled to find a way to equip them with the skills and knowledge they needed to face the world. She not only had to fight the prejudices of society, but also the condescension of the black male hierarchy of her church. Undaunted, she established the National Training School for Women and Girls in the Lincoln Heights section of Washington, D.C. in 1909. Until her death in 1961, she walked and talked with the most important leaders of her time, and they listened to her. Join us as the D.C. Community Humanities Council's Urban Odyssey series celebrates Nanny Helen Burroughs. One of the richest men in the world sent me a dollar. I asked him for a contribution for the school, thinking that, as a man who might have a penny or two to spare, that he might know that the education of the colored woman was worth something. Something. He sent a dollar. <laughs> he wants to know how I, as a businesswoman, plan to make use of this dollar. Well, I'm just as crafty as you, Mr. John D. Rockefeller. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy some peanuts, roast them, send them to you. I want you to sign your name to each and every one of them and send them back. And for a man for whom a dollar is peanuts, that's what I'll sell them for. See, we have to know how to get people to do the things they should. And Mr. Rockefeller never sent those peanuts back. You also have to know how to take care of yourself. We women, especially we colored women, have to know that. That's why the National Training School for Women and Girls is so important. But not yet. Getting ahead of myself. My mother and my daddy were born slaves. They watched with their young eyes at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, the surrender of General Lee to General Grant. They were witnesses to the end of the Civil War and the beginning of their lives as free men and women. They had nothing but they had freedom, the desire to make a living, and the faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, that they could do it. So they took the skills they learned in bondage and began working and living for themselves. That's what my mother wanted for me. Mama, why do we have to go away? Well, why can't I learn here? Well, what is Washington? Does, does God want us to go? From our home in Orange, Virginia, my mother, Jenny Burroughs Bell, looked north. The nation's capital beckoned. It was there that she would find another kind of life for herself and the one that she wanted for her five-year-old daughter, an education. Washington was a loud and busy place in 1883. I held on to my mother's hand real tight. We had to watch out for the streetcars and the horses and the horse. Well, I was used to that. It even made me a little homesick. And there were all those people 
and some of them didn't even speak English and they talked fast and wanted you to move fast too. But there was something else that reminded me of back home. It was the center market. There were all kinds of people there every day. They were selling vegetables and herbs and flowers and fish and everything. And it was just like down home in Orange, except it was in the middle of this big street called Pennsylvania Avenue, real close to the big white round building my mother called the Capitol. Mother, mother, my diploma. M Street High School. Nanny Helen Burroughs, majoring in business and domestic science. Class of 1896. This is my plan. I am going to stay right here in Washington and take care of you the way you have always taken care of me. Oh, hi, Miss Cooper. I wanted to be just like Anna Julia Cooper, a highly educated woman of grace and style who later became principal of the M Street High School and continued to teach there when it was renamed the Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. Mother, you know my teacher, Mrs. Cooper. I'm ready to start teaching Mrs. Cooper. I didn't get the position. Why not? Oh. She was appointed. Isn't there another position available? No. 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 What am I going to do now? This book will keep me from sin. Or sin will keep me from this book. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. God had other plans. It came to me so clearly. There would be a school that would give all colored girls a fair chance. Admission would not be based on social status or financial ability. Anyone who had the desire to want to learn to live in God's grace could attend. It would be called the National Training School for Women and Girls. But not yet. I'm getting ahead of myself. I left Washington for Philadelphia, where I worked as a bookkeeper and associate editor of the Christian Banner. And from there, I went on to Louisville, where I worked with the Foreign Mission Board of the National Baptist Convention. And it was there that the idea for the school began to take shape. Ladies? Ladies? Ladies of the Louisville Industrial Club, welcome. We are here to teach you how to take care of yourselves, your homes, and your children. We offer courses in hygiene, suitable dress, child care, cooking, cleaning, and sewing. Thank you. 
Now the fee was 10 cents per week. And this covered the cost of the house that we used and class materials. I had to come up with the rest of the cost myself. Now 10 cents per week was really something for those young colored women to pay in 1899. But they came and they learned because it was learning too. My business training at the M Street High School in Washington, D.C. stood me in good stead. The National Baptist Convention, filled with reverends and ministers and preachers, all of them men, was forming a women's convention auxiliary. It occurred to me and that if this male-dominated organization was recognizing the need for a women's auxiliary, then perhaps they would also recognize the need for a training school for their female counterparts. This would help us and help them too into the industrial momentum of the 20th century. Now we women couldn't vote. And our way of helping ourselves fell to ourselves. And most of our duties were domestic in nature. But women needed to know the basics for living in the 20th century. But not yet. I'm ahead of myself. So, at that meeting in Richmond, I spoke and I talked and I talked and I spoke until finally they elected me corresponding secretary of the Women's Auxiliary of the National Baptist Convention in 1900. They didn't pay me that first year. And I traveled to many places, the North, the South, the East. But they offered me $100 for my work with the group. And the next year, a salary of $40 per month, plus traveling expenses. And the Lord saw to it that I earned my compensation. Sisters, we are here for special purposes. We are here to confer with each other and to plan ways and means for the promotion of our religious life, for its reconstruction, if you please, upon a higher basis, for our common civilization, not in word, but in act, for the highest interest of humanity itself. My friends, what an occasion when we think of it in all its markings and dealings, the very blood flows more rapidly through our veins, betokening a new and quickened zeal. We entertain higher hopes for the race and for womanhood everywhere and are constrained like a roof of old to go forward. The low ebb at which I found women's work as I surveyed the field all over the country is due to the fact that they have no general organization under which to center their interest or from which to gain strength. The Negro Baptist women recommend to this convention the opening of a training school. That old chicken don't know he's dead. Finally, in 1906 at the Memphis session, a committee of four men and three women, including myself as corresponding secretary, and the Reverend E. C. Morris, president of the National Baptist Convention, chose Washington, D.C. as the location for the school. Now, it was chosen for at least one of the reasons that George Washington chose it as the federal city. It was a compromise, being neither too far north or too far south. And for our purposes, it had a very large and active Baptist population. It was the nation's capital. 
And as it was the place where I first had the vision of the school, it seemed fitting. They chose me to find the site. Ooh, had to be on a hill. I saw a for sale sign. I stood there on that beautiful autumn day and looked around. It was quiet. I could hear the wind nudging the leaves in the trees. Each step I took closer to the house, I began to understand what my mother must have felt at Appomattox at the sunset of slavery. Something good and holy was about to happen. I turned around. To, to the west, I could see the Anacostia River and the Southern Maryland Railway's railroad tracks inching their way into Prince George's County, Maryland. And further still to the west, I could see the Capitol and the Mall and the Washington Monument, no longer a big white tree stump. To the north and east, it was mostly farmland. The few houses thrown in where Levi Sheriff's daughters had divided the land. Spirit began to tell me this was the place. Off Benning Road, Lincoln Heights, Northeast Washington on a hill overlooking the nation's capital. A six acre tract of land with a four story, eight room house in need of repair. $6,000, $500 down in 10 days, another 500. But the money, where was I going to get the money? Those men hadn't given me one cent. They just told me, Nanny, go find a location. Lord, thank you for all of your blessings. Do I have your consent to purchase this property? If I do, then the money's no worry because it's all yours anyway. It doesn't matter in whose pocket it's in, it's all in trust to the possessor. And I trust your will and trust that if the money comes, then you mean for me to go ahead. Amen. And he did. It was ready on that day in 1909 when the doors of the school opened. We had lots of work to do. While the city beyond the Anacostia was being modernized every day, paved streets, electric streetcars, automobiles, and telephone service. Cows still waited on our side of the Anacostia. And though we had more houses now, those of us who lived in the far boundaries of the nation's capital were still farmers. The mortgage had been paid, and we had 31 girls from all over the country. Learn to do one thing superbly well was our motto. My dear Aunt Rachel, Mother was quite ill at the early part of February. Thank you, Mother. And has not yet fully recovered. 
Thank you I find for being the best you. example for me to follow. I am doing everything in my power I to have take care of I always done what I so thought that you and gained. the Lord wanted me to do. And I shall miss you sorely. I'm alone now. I no longer have my ever-watchful mother and friend by my side to tell me what to do and say. Do you remember the center market? The place that I was so in awe of when we came to Washington all those many long years ago? Well, it's gone now. And in its place is a stone building they call the National Archives. You can replace a wood building with a stone edifice, but you can never be replaced in my heart and in my life. I know, I know you are with the Lord. And as he is with you, you are with me. I will see you again when it is time. My train was late getting into Tuskegee, Alabama. So I was not there when the men voted to cut off what little bit of funding they were giving through the Women's Auxiliary. Despite the struggle for money, the school was a success. The Women's Auxiliary built this school. Why not give it to the women to whom it rightfully belonged, I asked. Resolved by the Board of Directors of the National Baptist Convention of the United States of America Incorporated, duly called at Tuskegee, Alabama. The 22nd day of June, A.D. 1938, that the convention does hereby recommend that it withdraw all connections, allegiance, and support to the said training school in Washington, D.C., and that it does recommend that the women's auxiliary withdraw all connections, allegiance, and support Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that death is there, or that his guests are in the depths of hell. Our friends from all over the country came to our aid, including members of the white community, like the Women's Missionary Union of the Southern Baptist Convention. The school on the hill survived. It's 1941. We teach our girls how to clean up the community in which they lived. We call our school the school of the three Bs, the Bible, the bath, and the broom, symbolic of clean lives, clean bodies, and clean homes. This is more than a felicitous sobriquet because the race which has these three instruments is the most highly civilized. I was elected president of the Women's Auxiliary National Baptist Convention. <laughs> yes, times were changing. President Eisenhower invited me to his inauguration and inaugural ball. It was January 
1953, was held at the National Guard Armory just across the Anacostia. I never went to college, but I received an honorary law degree and an honorary doctorate from Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ah, thousands of girls graduated from my school, and many of them went to college. I had come a long way since my first day in Washington, holding my mother's hand so tight. Ah, there's so much to do, and somebody will have to do it. I see it now. You named the school after me, the Nanny Helen Burroughs School, a private elementary school. Parents must ask God's forgiveness for willful parental neglect, help their children to grow up and be somebody. Now, laziness, that is a social evil which must be stamped out by intensive public sentiment. Too many Negro men and boys are idle. Learn the religion of Jesus Christ and live it.